study of Greek and Corinth for ministry. And according to the languages, examples from New Testament Greek and historical encouragements. I want to start us off with a quote from D.B. Warfield, writing in 1909, A low view of the functions of ministry will naturally carry with it a low conception of the training necessary for it. And as uh, Darushi has an article, The Prophet of Employing the Biblical Languages, he summarizes Warfield by saying, If ministers are to be merely overseers of religious programs, agents designed to advance modern culture, or inspirational speakers, then certainly Hebrew and Greek are unnecessary. But if ministers are called to be specialists in the Word and winsome advocates for the truth, Everything changes. So first we'll look at the importance of the details and also present a word of caution in the angels. So the first example comes from Matthew 5, 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. In Greek, and then God let go of the men, those on Helate, O Uranus, Kai, Ege, Iota, in Ea, Korea. So the Iota in Ea, Korea, the smallest letter, the smallest stroke of a pen. Girushi notes in his article how John Owen, the leading Puritan of the 17th century, correctly noted in 1678. That the words of Scripture being given thus, immediately from God, every apex, tittle or iota, and the whole is considerable. That's that which is an effect of divine wisdom, and therefore filled with sacred truth. But not only there, according to their place and measure. So I like how John Owen says that, and what is that there? According to their place and measure. While everything is inspired to the detail, each has their place. And that's the word of caution as we move through this weekend and learn Greek, not to overemphasize something that does not need to be emphasized. But you see every t- uh, John and Tittle as important. Um, sometimes a single letter may affect the interpretation, as we see in Galatians 3.16. Tode Abraham, Erethesan, I, Epigalea, Kaite, Spermati, Mote, Ulebi, Kaitois, Sperma, Asi, Os, Epi, Polon, Al Os, and Onos, Enos, Kaite, Spermati, Su, Os, Eskin, Christus, Christos. So now the promises are made to Abraham. To his offspring. It does not say to the offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring, who is Christ. Paul thought the details of Genesis 12 7 mattered and made a theological point pointing to Christ over the difference between a plural noun and a singular noun. Spermati, spermatini. Another example. We see in Romans 5 1. He died to Pentes, whom at his fails, wherein a echo man, or echo man, let me stress that, I'm a crowd man, cross tongue, they are, the atu, per you, a mon, yesu, christu. So in Romans 5 we read, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace. Echo man, with the Omicron. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But some scholars, such as Stanley Porter, have argued that this verse should be rendered, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, let, let us have. So, let go with the omega, based on textual criticism. So, we have, we have peace. Let <laughs> And then let us have. So, this one letter would change it from uh, to a subjunctive. Let us have. So 
So given the wider context and wider theology of Christian peace with God and the manuscript evidence, uh, I would suggest we take these into consideration in determining the place and measure, as John Owen said, the place and measure of this home of God or this home of God. Uh, this example of Romans 5.1 is given in the work book under subjunctives, and if we have time, we can get to that. Okay. Another example, Matthew 22, verse 31. Here, Jesus quotes Exodus 3.6 and makes a theological point of recognizing the tense of the word. Peride, tes, anastasios, ton, nekron, uk, anaget, doi. Anaget, doi. So, we think we need to go to the Lagantas. They go a me. They go a me. That's not very nice. We'll get to that. That's the other one. Oh, is it? That's right, yeah. They go a me. O Theos Abraham. Kai O Theos Isaac. Kai O Theos Jacob. Luke has been. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am, and go in me. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So the present tense of a me, ego a me, I am, is important. And Jesus picks up, up on this, and he makes a theological point to show that, that the resurrection of the dead is true. As Dr. Quarles points out in his forthcoming commentary on Matthew, the use of the present tense, I am, ego and me, is critical to Jesus' argument. At the, at the time that Yahweh spoke the words from the burning bush, the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had been dead for centuries. If these men had ceased to exist at the moment of physical death, as the Sadducees maintained, it would have been, I was the God of, and that would have been more appropriate. But it doesn't say that. It says, I am the God of, which implies that the patriarchs still existed, thus refuting annihilationism of the sect. So while the tense of the verb here is important, we should also keep in mind Owen's remark about the place and measure of each iota. For example, we'll look at an example where you don't want to overdo something like that. And then in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Have you ever noticed that the verbs of this prayer are in the aorist tense? And you might say, well, why is that? You might have even heard a pastor maybe appeal to the aorist tense and make a point about it. And we see here, I'll tell Stone, Pasuke Sete. So that's actually just um, going to pray, but it's present. Okay. Um, it says, Pater, Emon, Om, Do, and Tois, Uranos, Adios, Etor, Adios, Etor. It's hallowed, hallowed be your name. That's an heiress. And then in uh, 610, El Etoy, another heiress, imperative, come. That your kingdom come, that it was a lay of two. Ginet the toy, another heiress, that your will be done to the new El Masu. Pas in Uranu Noi Kai Epi Jace. Tan Arton, Emon. Tan Arton, Emon, Tan Epi Asun Das. This is a weird word. To give and pay them. Another heiress. Give us our daily bread and man say we are on. So pray again like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, as your spirit. Your kingdom come, your will be done, as earth on earth as it is in heaven, all heirs. Give us this daily give us this day our daily bread. So what's going on? Why do we have the aorists here? Uh, Dr. Markle points out the aorist tense form um, is used here, but they're not used for just a single occurrence. You may 
every time, or maybe like the general idea of the error is just like it happens at a certain point. But that's not what's going on here because it's, it's a repeated. You should do this as the example to pray. Give us our daily bread. Is it a prayer you pray daily? Um, so why is it errors? Um, and Merkel argues the errors imperative is greatly favored in prayers. So it's not too complicated. That's the, the way the language works. So in these cases, the literary genre, prayer, virtually determines the use tense form. Thus, the use of the aorist imperative should not be over-interpreted, Dr. Merkel says. While verb tense are important, they should not be over-interpreted. Let the context and the genre be king. So Merkel gives an example uh, of people actually interpreting it this way. Uh, both Rogers and Rogers actually state that the heiress looks at a specific request. So it's a specific request, a one-time request. But Michael points out, this is actually a daily and thus repeated prayer. It's also probably going too far, Michael says, to claim that the heiress is to convey an urgent request. In the end, the genre is determining the factor for why the heiress can't form when selected. Some make... Uh, so make sure you assess the context and the genre of what's going on and realize that verb tenses are not a one size fits all. They function differently in different contexts. So keep that in mind. Uh, even in C.S. Matthew 5, 18, as we looked at, it fits everything in Scripture and is divinely inspired. And from the verb tense to the iotas, they are divinely inspired. We must assess them properly. Um, and as, again, as John says, according to their place and measure. Another good example of uh, the importance of the details is in John 8, 58. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Again, we have a, an ego and a me, but it's in a different context. And it has a different uh, sense here than what we looked at before. For a, a Jehovah's Witness, for example, the New, New World Translation does not say, well, before Abraham was, I am. It says, before Abraham came into existence, I have been. And so what are they doing there? Well, they're trying to get away from Jesus being the great I am. That's clearly what he's doing. And that's what the, Bible, what the phrase means. So some of them say the present tense I am is not acceptable in English translation when combined with a past tense indicator. So, Abraham, before Abraham was, I am. So they say, you would never say before last week I exist, or since last Tuesday I exist. And to that I say, yeah, we wouldn't say that. <laughs> Jesus does that. <laughs> and he's not saying that he, uh, yeah, so, so when we're, uh, that, other Jehovah's Witnesses go on to say, when correctly rendered, there is no identification, indication of Jesus with Jehovah. Jesus simply said he existed before Abraham, referring to his pre-human existence. And so some argue that the I am, the end of me, is a historical present. And yes, that is actually a thing in certain circumstances, but not here. So, like Dr. Quarles argues, the historical present is used only with verbs of action. Only with verbs of action. Never stated verbs in the New Testament. The verb me never appears, never appears as a historical present in the New Testament. Unless you want to fit your theology and you want to change it in this passage. What the verb looks So knowing this will help you explain how John 8.58 depicts Jesus referring to himself as the great I am. As Carson Notes, the Jews take up stones to kill him presupposes that they understand these words as some kind of blasphemous claim to deity. Inspiration, what is God's word? We've talked about it being divinely inspired to uh, all the details. I want to just take a look at, before we get into it further, with the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy, how they uh, phrase it. I think it's a good explanation. Article 10, we affirm the inspiration Strictly speaking, applies only to the autographic text of Scripture, which is the providence of God, can be ascertained from available manuscripts with great accuracy. We further affirm that copies and translations of Scriptures are the Word of God to the extent 
that they faithfully represent the original. So, when we talk about translations, we need to understand them in light that they are only inspired as far as they faithfully represent the original. So, our task is to understand the inspired Word of God, in which, strictly speaking, only applies to the original manuscripts. And so, copies and translations are very accurate, in which we'll talk about. And our focus, but our focus should be on the original. This also depicts the great need for Bible skilled translators in every language and every generation, as languages are always changing. They're in motion, so changing from one generation to the next. So it is important we have skilled and faithful men and women trained in the original languages so we can pass down the scriptures accurately and clearly. So word meaning. Look at an example from Matthew 16, 18, in just a second. But we have uh, Daryl Berlin, who has uh, made resources for studying New Testament Greek, points out the value in learning Greek by showing how the knowledge of the original language to help you better understand word meanings. While also preventing misunderstandings. He writes, word studies are a source of many exegetical fallacies because establishing the meaning of a word from a lexicon or a word from Bible software can pigeonhole your understanding of a word. Words have a lexical range of meanings that will vary based on the context. Again, context is a very important if you haven't noticed. So the same is true in any language. If you want to know what a word means, look at its context. It's very important. Erling goes on to point out and ask an insightful question. Sure, a word study will suggest certain word meanings. You can look in the lexicon and you can see what it suggests that it can mean in different contexts. But how do you know which one is right without a natural feel for how the language and words work? So, for example, we might have time to look in greater detail later, but the word tetra in Matthew 16, 18, Ago des or lego hati su e petras, kai epi take te petra. For a word study of the word petra, rock will bring some valuable information to the table to consider. For example, knowing that, as Dr. Quarles points out in his commentary, the masculine noun had fallen into disuse in the New Testament. So this information will be helpful in determining how the word is being used in the context. For in the context, the word Petra is being used figuratively. But the question is, what is it figuratively referring to? So, Matthew 16, 18, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. So you notice the, the similarity between Peter's name, Petras, and this rock. Petra, which you would not get in English. Peter and Rock are totally different words. Um, so you can, that would be one benefit of knowing and looking at the original languages to bring that detail out and would help you interpret what Jesus is referring to by this rock. And knowing the information about how Dr. Willis says the masculine noun for this word had fallen into disuse um, would, would help you know. Uh, the gender, why that, that word is uh, feminine, if it is referring to Peter, masculine, which we can hopefully get into more in worship. But all I'm say is looking at the original languages would help you assess these different options. Which, as Dr. Rob Sterner points out, knowing biblical Hebrew and biblical Greek unveils the interpretive options of the given text and assist in properly adjudicating among them. For example, he notes in the Greek language, the genitive case alone has over 30 different grammatical functions. And that's his opinion. And other people have, you know, that's, that's their genitives have a lot of different functions they could be used as. And he says, of which translators must choose only one in a given occurrence. And most English translations just kind of go with the general of. Put the genitive and you kind of have to figure it out on your own from the context of what's going on. So 
because English readers frequently have little clue what the possibilities even are that the tra- translators rejected. So Dr. Sterner goes on to ask an insightful question. How will you determine which translation gives the best sense? How do you determine what the best translation is? Gut feeling or the, the Holy Spirit whoosh, he says. <laughs> For this, readers need a knowledge of the biblical languages and access to the grammars, the lexica, scholarly commentary that deal directly with the original text. I think it's a really important point. Like I said, from first-hand experience, I've talked with people who have chosen one translation for a particular verse or word over another because they thought it sounded better or it was easier to understand. Just because something may be easier to understand, it may not be the correct sense of what's going on there. Without uh, rooting their assessment and conclusion in the actual study of the word or the context. For example, we look at 1 Timothy 3.6. This weekend, we'll look at this. Um, man de alfutam in amen to put this as crema in esse to diabalu. It sounds less threatening. The devil. He must not be a recent convert, or, or he may be puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Condemnation of the devil. That's that genitive there. And uh, also, you could look at the word prima, which is interesting. I did a study on the word prima for my Romans class. Look at every instance that word is used and how it's functioning in different places. But also, um, because it could be prima, could be uh, both judgment, but it could be in a positive or negative sense. So you can be judged to be innocent, or you can be judged to be guilty. So what, how is this prima to be translated? Uh, ju- and most people, even when they see judge as an interesting translation, they think negative anyways. Uh, so how do you, that's one of the difficulty I haven't even come up to, to try to explain how English works in people. But anyways, uh, in the context, this is probably a negative uh, judgment because it's in the context of the devil, so it's a guilty judgment. And that's why the ESV translates prima as condemnation. Uh, so that's uh, yeah, condemnation. That's clearly negative judgment. But second, how should we interpret the genitive to the abalu? The, subje- the, uh, the genitive is from uh, the subjective genitive is followed by the NET. So the NET says that, that the punishment that the devil will exact. So what is the punishment? What's the relation? It's saying it's the subject of genitive, the punishment that the devil will exact. That's the NET. Or the uh, New Living Translation says the devil would cause him to fall. Uh, which is real interesting because they do not even translate the word judgment there in the New Living Translation. Anyway. Second choice is the objective. So you have the subjective and the objective genitive. The objective genitive is followed by the NIV. And it says the same judgment as the devil. So uh, that's also followed by the NASB, the condemnation incurred by the devil. And that's the most popular uh, rendering in the New King James Version as well. The same condemnation as the devil. So the objective genitive has the prideful new convert being threatened with condemnation of God, by God, that was exacted on the devil. Uh, while the subjective genitive has the devil condemning the prideful new convert. So you have two options. Is God doing the judgment or is the devil doing the judgment? And you have to decide, you have to make kind of, or you can just leave it condemnation of the devil and just let the English reader to decide what's going on. Um, which I think we probably need to make, make that clear. Um, either way, at the end of the day, there is the threat of condemnation, either by God or the devil. I don't know which one is it. And I'll stay tuned to find out this weekend. So we're going to for that. Emphasis. The original languages can point out emphasis in the text that may get lost in translation. Erwin goes on to note, that the use of the Greek parenthesis, where he writes, here we should think specifically for rhetorical features, such as alliteration, poetic structure, word order, and the like. 
most of which are completely lost in translation, but all of which are, are clear and discernible to their school in the biblical languages. We saw a little bit of this with Peter's name, the word rock, right? We have Petros and Petra in Matthew 16 18. Another example of uh, word choice can be seen in the book of Luke with his uh, use of the repeated phrase, Anthropos, this, a certain man. And this was, this is a great thing because I always forget about this because it's so small. It's like a certain man, a certain man did that, a certain man did that. But if you look at it and you recognize this pattern, um, which some translations don't translate this the same way each time, so you wouldn't see that in English, but recognizing this repeated phrase will help you actually adjudicate whether, for example, that the story of the rich man and Lazarus is a real story or a made-up parable. So um, we'll discuss uh, this feature more in detail in a section on pronouns. Stay tuned for that. Another example of emphasis occurs in Hebrews 13.5. Akala Largu Guros O Topos Arpumino Tos Harusin Atos Bar Berkin Ume Se Ano Ude Ume Se Akatapalit So that last phrase Ume Se Ana Ude Ume a lot of negatives right there. So, in English, keep your life free from the world of money and be content with what you have. For he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's the ESV. But what doesn't come across is the emphasis of the repeated negative particles. Um, Spurgeon has a sermon on this. Never, 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 never. Because <laughs> it literally says, um, I will never, never leave you, no, know, never, never forsake you. But so if you translate each negative particle. As, Markle, as Dr. Markle points out, Charles Spurgeon often referred to this text in his sermons and preached this text on more than one occasion. This is what some title was. Dr. Markle goes on to point out, although not formally trained, Spurgeon taught himself Greek and knew that studying the Greek text would improve his preaching. We would do well to follow his example by paying attention to the original text so that we hear and feel the full weight of God's message to us. Someone else has uh, also pointed out how many people have made the excuse, made it many times, that sticking to the Greek may spoil the originality of your sermon or your teaching. Such a statement is just the opposite of the truth. A scholarly appreciation of Hebrew and Greek did not preclude originality in the sermons of Spurgeon, for example. The same can be said in modern times with the example and encouragement from Dane Wortland. If you've seen his name around recently, he said in his really popular book, and I have not yet uh, added it, read it yet, but maybe after I graduate, maybe I'll finish it. Or if it's on audio, but maybe I can do it. Do that that way. But he, re- he recently wrote that seminaries, if you are considering changing how much Greek and Hebrew you require of your MDiv grads, let me encourage you to do just that by adding more. No such thing as too much of the languages. I use them every day in pastoral ministry, most important classes I have. I feel like it's a big statement. And he's the author of uh, Gentle and Lowly. The heart of Christ for sinners and sufferers, in which he draws readers to Matthew 11, where Jesus describes himself as a gentle and lowly heart, longing for his people to find rest in him. This is a widely read and popular book, and I, I think we should listen to things encouraging in the advice. So moving on to translations confidence, accuracy, precision. So, with all these examples, in my attempt to convince you, that knowing and using Greek to study the Bible is important and helpful. I also want to note, as one author mentions, how our modern English translations of the Bible are excellent. Most of the major English translations available today are superb renderings of the original Greek and Hebrew. Even though, nevertheless, he goes on to say, in any translation, this has already been said today, but 
not everything that was communicated in the original language can be precisely conveyed in another language. Some nuances do not transfer well from one language to another. De Ricci uh, also notes this in his article, The Proper of Employing the Biblical Languages. He notes the graciousness of God in our translations this way. First, the Lord has graciously made His Word translatable so that those from every tribe and language and people and nation may hear of and believe in the Savior. Ezra and the Levites helped a non-Hebrew speaking audience understand the law. In my age, the New Testament authors often preach from the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. And people proclaim the gospel at Pentecost in a way that each was hearing in his own language. As such, believers today can and should utilize the quality translations available to us in order to meet God and make Him known. So I don't want to devalue accurate translations. So translations are good, they're beneficial, have been, been used by people even in the Bible to teach God's Word. Given that you can learn a lot and teach and preach faithful sermons and lessons from translations, all that your work will be resting on the work of others, which is only natural in many areas of life. We can't be experts in every area of life. For example, I put some trust in the editors of the Greek New Testament. I'm, I'm familiar with the textual criticism. I can look up the manuscripts. I can look up all the commentaries and assess the information. But at the end of the day, there's going to be times where I'm, I'm trusting Dr. Porl. I'm trusting Dr. Minster on their analysis of uh, textual criticism. That's not my expertise. Maybe in 20 years it may be, but not right now. And so uh, I'm kind of here. We have areas of our life where we're putting trust in the experts. That's only natural. So even though I know my way around the field of textual criticism and I can critically evaluate it, I recognize the expertise of what goes up now before me. Uh, for example, if you're taking, uh, if you're making a major point in your teaching, of a particular word in the English translation, you have to realize you're putting trust in a translator, translator's choice. So if you're going to preach on Matthew 16 18, and you're going to make a huge deal about people the rock, you know, you have to know the, what's going on and why you, what, what's going on there with the translation. Um, you have to realize you're putting trust in the translator's choice, which is, which is fine. A lot of people have to do that. I just want you to be aware that's what you're doing. And so you're, I don't want you to stake your whole theology on, on something on one word or translation. Um, and on that level, on that level, it complicates the matter is that the translator may be using the English word differently than you use it. So you may have to now decipher between two levels of meaning. Why not just go back to the source if you're able? Um, so going back to the original would provide you a level of confidence and accuracy of interpretation that you would otherwise be distributing out and trusting others. As Luther states about those without the languages, even though what they said about a subject at times was perfectly true, they were never sure whether it was really present there in the passage, whereby their interpretation they thought to find it. Because they're, again, they're trusting someone's translation, so that level of confidence is not there. Similarly, when asked whether the biblical languages are truly important in sermon preparation, uh, seeing as there are many excellent commentaries and pastors will never attain the expertise of scholars, like I said, Scott Hafman helpfully responds to that question and says, but in the end, let me see if that's correct. So he, he begins to go this way. Knowing the biblical languages enables us to do something that very few commentaries ever do. Trace the flow of the argument of the text. Commentaries save us time by providing the historical, linguistic, cultural, canonical, literary insights that we simply do not have time to mine for. Um, but for $35, we can benefit from 10 years of a scholar's life. So you get in the commentary. But at the end of the day, he says, in the end, what we preach is the point and argument of the biblical text, as informed by this backdrop of the commentary, but not replaced by it. Commentaries and translations 
do not excel in tracing the flow of an argument and mapping out the melody line and the theological heartbeat of the text. So by definition, most commentaries uh, look at one specific part, while translation often obscure the density and complexity, or even sometimes ambiguity. Sometimes the text is ambiguous purposefully for a reason, perhaps. Um, so, with all that said and done, we do not learn Greek in order to do word studies, but in order to see where the conjunctions are and where they're not, where the participles are, uh, they must be decoded, where clauses begin and end, where the verb tenses really make a difference, and like I said, all the verb tenses don't make a difference. And in the end, with the main, with looking for what the main point of the text actually is. So similarly to the idea of accuracy is the of the text, is the idea of precision. How precise can you be in explaining a text which is perhaps a little blurry through the lens of translation? Someone gave, gives this analogy. Um, reading the Bible without knowing Greek and Hebrew is like watching a basic television, while reading the Bible knowing Greek and Hebrew is like watching a 98-inch ultra-high definition 8K television with stereo surround sound. You can fully understand what's going on with a basic television. But with a 98-inch ultra-high definition 8K television, you can give added depth and added clarity. So with the help of the Holy Spirit, anyone can accurately understand the Bible in English. However, knowing Hebrew and Greek helps to better understand the nuances and richness of the biblical text. For example, John 2, 19. Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it. So, what's going on there? Lucifer, say, destroy, is actually an imperative. So, is Jesus commanding them to destroy the temple? Well, sort of. <laughs> but from the context, you can tell that the imperative must be functioning a little different. Uh, Dr. Wallace calls this a conditional imperative and writes that it is reminiscent of the ironic commands of the Jewish prophets. Uh, of course, uh, Isaiah 8, 9, Amos 4, 4, for these ironic commands. So it thus functions as a taunt or a dare, like can to go ahead, destroy this temple if you dare, I will raise it up. So uh, knowing the Greek will help you feel the full weight of Jesus' claim here um, that you wouldn't necessarily get in English. So the way I see it is not everyone has access or the financial means or the time or capabilities to get this TV. Especially this one. I, I, I literally Googled most expensive TV. <laughs> and that is, I don't even know if people really would buy that. I don't know. But not every, luckily, Greek, learning Greek is not that expensive. <laughs> okay? You can get a good ed education, and there's free resources online. And if you have the time, the capabilities to get something like this, to get the equivalent of a high definition TV, you should get it. And you should share what you find, and the depth and clarity, you should share those findings with others. And I'm, like I said, unlike the big screen TV, you can. Uh, well, this is another difference. You can't just go and buy the knowledge. You can't just go and buy the skill and just say, all right, now I have it. Uh, it takes work, but it's worth it because we're not studying a language for language's sake, but so that we can better understand, better teach, better apply the very words of God. It is a high calling. So wise words go with great power. It comes great responsibility. Just as you look up to and trust the experts above you, you may be somebody's expert one day in the future. You may be an expert for somebody right now. Somebody in your small group, somebody in your church, somebody in your youth ministry, somebody in your family. They say, oh, he goes to seminary, he knows everything about the Bible. I'm going to ask him a question. Uh, so don't take it lightly. 
um, people will listen to you. You can persuade people on your thoughts and interpretations. And Dr. Quarles recently pointed this out, this great responsibility in my ordination service, um, going from 2 Timothy 2.15, which says, Spugaston, Seatom, Yotimon, Paraset, Sai, Tu, Wapu, Eo, Ergaten, Anapeso, Kunta, Lord, Wapu, 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 do your best to present yourself to God as a proof, as one proof, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. For we'll, we will all be judged according to how we handle God's word and teach it to others. This is a great responsibility. So let us use every tool, every skill available to us to our best ability to rightly handle the word of truth. Martin Luther speaks of this great responsibility and emphasizes the need for knowing the original languages in his letter to the councilmen of all cities in Germany that they establish and maintain Christian schools, 1524. He writes, When men attempt to defend the faith with such uncertain arguments and mistaken proof texts, are not Christians put to shame, and they are laughing stock in the eyes of adversaries, who know the language? The adversaries only become more stiff necked in their error. They have an excellent pretext for regarding our faith as a mere human delusion. This point makes a lot of sense from an apologetic standpoint. Even from teaching in the church, as Luther says, attempting to defend the faith with such uncertain arguments and mistaken proof texts. I've seen this time and time again where we might have the right theology not from the right text. And that is a, a not good teaching because uh, that's when we're trying to get in, we're trying to explain the Word of God. We don't want to misrepresent what God is saying. Um, we do not want to be people who teach with uncertain arguments or mistaken proof texts. We want to stand firm on a firm foundation. This knowledge and use of the original languages may also earn you some respect from your hearers so they might be more ready to consider what you have to say. We also look to the advice of St. Augustine. He speaks of the importance of knowing the original languages. And so he says, to avoid constant stumbling. That's why we didn't know the original languages. Indeed, there are plenty of problems to work out even when one is well versed in languages. So while showing the need for the original languages, Augustine also brings up a good point. Just because you know the language, doesn't guarantee you arrive at the correct conclusion. Or every theological or interpretive perplexity will disappear. For there are plenty of problems to work out, even when one is well versed in the languages. The Rishi also notes this. He says, It does not automatically make one a good exegete, a text, or an articulate, winsome proclaimer of God's truth to a new world. Linguistic skill also does not necessarily result in deeper levels of holiness or in greater knowledge of God. So we need to have correct expectations. Knowing Greek is not the decoding ring. Even with knowledge and skill in the language, spirit illumination is needed, along with work, study, and the willingness to change one's interpretation. While many things in Scripture are clear, in Greek and in English, uh, we, st- we see even in Greek, even in the first century, a contemporary figure thought that some of Paul's writings were hard to understand. This is a this is a daunting task and a you know, comforting and an anonymous. Second Peter three sixteen. This is one of my favorite verses. Post kai in pasias tas epistolias lalom in atos peri tukon in as. Estin Dum Santa Tina A Amethas Tai Estere Toy Stere the Love Sum Stere Lucine. I'm not the best reader in Greek, guys. Pascai 
Tas, Lopas, Rapas, Cross, Ten, Vidyan, Oton, Apolaya. So, as he does in all his letters, when, we speak, when he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. Thanks, Peter. Which the ignorant and the unable and the unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. This is a really important verse. Uh, it's very encouraging at some level. But if, if Peter had a hard time understanding some things in Paul's letters, certainly. Uh, we need be okay with that. I think that's God humbling us. Let's work hard to understand. Um, we should hold our inter- interpretations of different difficult passages loosely, not having our theological framework built upon difficult passages. Um, second, notice Peter doesn't say that all his writings are difficult to understand, but only some of them. Uh, this fact is also evident because he apparently Peter knows what they cannot mean. Uh, this is helpful. For, he, for him to recognize how some twist Paul's writings. So, Sarah of Lucene, some twist the meaning, right? But so Peter's like, hey, hey, I know it doesn't mean that, right? And so, uh, this is a great passage because Peter seemingly places uh, another reason. He puts Paul's letters on the same plane as the Old Testament scriptures. Peter says, uh, when he compares Paul's writings, and he says, what the heretics do, they twist the script of Paul's letters like they do the rest of the scriptures. So, Lopois um, Ralphas, the rest of the scriptures, the remaining scriptures. So, you have Paul and the Old Testament scriptures being put on par here by this contemporary Peter. That's amazing. Um, so, we should also listen to the wisdom related to the study of the Bible. Uh, from perhaps the most prominent American preacher in the past century, Billy Graham. Around 60 years old, Graham looked back over over his ministry, and in an interview with Christianity Today in 1977, he said, One of my greatest regrets is that I have not studied enough. I wish I had studied more and preached less. He says, People have pressured me into speaking to groups when I should have been studying and preparing. Donald Barnhouse said that if he knew the Lord was coming in three years, he would spend two of them studying and one preaching. Graham said, I'm trying to make it up. He also goes on to say, I did not spend enough time with my family when they were growing up. You can't recapture those years. I might add here that through the years I have met many, many people, and I feel terrible that I cannot keep up with all those friends and acquaintances. He goes on to say, I just read this whole article. We didn't get interviewed. He says, I would not have encouraged the Billy Graham Evangelical, uh, Evangelistic Association and its affiliates to get so big. We have been trying to come back here and there without affecting the ministry that God has called us to. So he said, but again, he says, one of my greatest regrets. This is the biggest preacher in the past century in America that he didn't study enough. Maybe learn from his mistakes. His regret. May we see the importance of study, even if no one else recognizes it, right? Because what people see you in your public teaching or in your gatherings, they don't see the hours and hours and days and months, years of the study. But it's worth it. Uh, for example, me uh, right now, I just am a uh, pastor at a church, a little church, 50 members, uh, two, 10 people watching online, right? But I'm putting about 12 to 15 hours a week for a 30-minute sermon. All right? And it's worth it. Uh, that's about their, all they're seeing on Sunday morning at 30 minutes. That's 3% of the 15 hours. That's all they, they, they see that 3%. All right? uh, so they don't see the 97% of the time that I'm putting in. Um, that's not counting my years of school, reading, training. Forget where I'm at today. But that's all right, because we're teaching God's Word correctly, and that's what it's all worth for. Another example is in uh, 1918, speaking out against the secularization of Christian education, uh, Dr. Markin asserts, In many colleges, the study of Greek is almost abandoned. 
the real trouble with modern exaltation of practical studies, in quotes, at the expense of humanities is that it's based on a vicious conception of the whole purpose of education. He says, the modern conception of the purpose of education is merely to intend enable a man to live, but not give him those things that make life worth living. That's deep. That's deep. That's deep. So, we want to give you something that you can, that makes life worth living. Not just the practical. Practical, practical is important. We're going to get a lot of practical things today. Uh, but at the foundation, it's worth it at the end. It's worth the study. Jerusha also knows the spiritual benefits of learning the languages. When he writes, the countless hours of memorizing, parsing, diagramming, and tracing the logical flow of thought are designed not only to help us grasp the biblical message, but also to conform ourselves to it. That's an interesting point. I'm, I have never heard it put this way. Uh, A.T. Robinson has a chapter in his book, and he says it like this. Grammar is a means of grace. And so what he means by that, in more than one way, and at times, God makes it difficult for us to interpret His Word correctly in order to fight our laziness and to develop character. We tempted to give up on the languages due to their taxing nature, they the students of God, but students of God's book, remember that the Lord is graciously calling them to greater God dependence and less, less self-reliance. Because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So grammar is a means of grace. I think it's a great way to look at it. In the same line of thinking, the Rishi also notes how John Owen spoke of God's providence for our good in the field of textual criticism. Yeah. So he's taking that same idea, and he says, well, it may be somewhat speculative, it, it is really intriguing. It's, it, um, he says, Owen states, John Owen, God by his providence preserving the whole entire, talking about the whole entire king, scripture. He says, suffered the less lesser variety to fall out in or among the copies we have for the quickening and exercising of our diligence in our search into, our, into his word. So, even in the study of textual criticism, John Owen said this was ordained by God so that we would depend on him in the, in the study of textual criticism. And so, uh, I, I, a paraphrase of what John Owen said would be, uh, textual criticism is a means of grace. And I've never heard that put that way before. And it is, we don't know the mind of God for like why he did what he did with the scriptures, but this makes a lot of sense, and at least one aspect of it, to see everything as a means of grace in some way. So in sum, uh, if you want to read this whole article, this is really good, uh, the Richard's article. At the end, it provides four main reasons to learn the original languages. And it's a good summary. He says, using the biblical languages exalts Jesus by affirming God's wisdom and giving us his word in a book. So God's word is the foundation. And then the second one, second reason, using the biblical languages gives us greater certainty that we have grasped the meaning of God's book. The certainty, the confidence we have in interpretation. And third, using the biblical languages can assist in developing Christian maturity that validates our witness in the world. And fourth, using the biblical languages enables a fresh and bold expression in defense of the truth in preaching and teaching. As uh, B.B. Wardfield says, that the minister is the mouthpiece of the Most High, charged with a message to deliver, to expound and enforce, standing in the name of God before men, to make known to them who and what this God is, and what His purposes of grace are, and what His will for His people is. Then the whole aspect of things have changed. Then is the primary duty of the minister to know His message, to know the instructions which we have been committed to for his people. To know them thoroughly, to be prepared to declare them with confidence, with exactness, to command, commend them with wisdom, to urge them with force, and defend them with skill, and to build them up by means of them into true knowledge of God. 
command of his will, which will be unassailable in the face of the fiercest assault. No second-hand knowledge of the revelation of God for the salvation of a ruined world can suffice the needs of a ministry, whose function it is to convey this revelation to men, commend it to their acceptance, and apply it in detail to their needs. For such a ministry, nothing will suffice for it but to know, to know the book, to know it firsthand, to know it through and through. And what is required, first of all, for training men for such a ministry is that the book should be given them in its very words, as it has come from God's hand in the fullness of meaning. As that meaning has been ascertained by the laborers and generations of men who have brought to bear upon it all the resources of sanctified scholarship and consecrated that was a long quote, but I could say all that in depth. So, um, so I hope this was helpful. I hope this encouraged you and, see, and hope I could convince you that knowing the languages are important. And we'll look at more examples throughout the weekend of where this actually plays out practically. And we'll get to some practical ways that you can continue using your languages.